All right. I want to welcome everybody to the 15th annual Creative Arts and Scholarly Engagement Festival, our case festival, our annual student conference at the Margaret Walker Center and Jackson State University, inspired by our founder, Dr. Margaret Walker Alexander, when she was a professor of English uh, here at Jackson State and founded our institute in 1968, hosting some of the very first conferences on the topic of Black Studies here uh, on our campus. We're so excited to be back this year um, for the first time in two years due to the pandemic. And while it is unusual that we are here in this virtual world, we're grateful uh, to be able to do it. And we're grateful to all of you for being here, for participating, and uh, for supporting particularly our young people who will be presenting over the course of concurrent sessions tomorrow. There's still time for you to register for those concurrent sessions, which will be on Zoom. You can go to the Margaret Walker Center um, uh, website and find out more information. And all of our plenary sessions, such as the program today on the man who lived underground, will be available on the Margaret Walker Center um, Facebook page. I should thank here as well the Mississippi Arts Commission, the Greater Jackson Arts Council, and the Jackson Free Press Magazine for their support of the Case Festival. Without their support, none of this would be possible. With that said, I'm going to get out of the way. We've got a lot of ground to cover. We have an amazing panel uh, that will be with us uh, today for this program. I am so excited about The Man Who Lived Underground. I was grateful to get an advanced copy and to be able to read it. And what an amazing book and the essays that accompany it. And they're just absolutely essential. We are reprising this conversation from one that we did last uh, fall in honor of the 75th anniversary of Black Boy. Uh, and the, these group of panelists are absolutely amazing. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce our moderator, Professor C. Lee McInnes, who is an advisory board member for the Margaret Walker Center. He's an instructor of English at Jackson State, 
the former publisher and editor of Black Magnolia's Literary Journal, journal the author of seven books, including four collections of poetry, one collection of short fiction, and one work of literary criticism. He is the former first runner up of the Miri Baraka Sonia Sanchez Poetry Award sponsored by North Carolina A&T. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Professor McInnes. Um, thanks, uh, Professor McInnes, so good to see you. Glad to have you here. I'm gonna let you run away with it. Dr. Lucky, thank you so much. Uh, you know, from all of us at Jackson State and around the country, we appreciate the job that you do as the director of the Margaret Walker uh, Alexander Center. So we just appre we appreciate you. We appreciate the, you, you, the work that you do and the entire staff putting together the Case Festival. So without further ado, folks, Again, my name is C.D. McInnes, and we have a high-powered panel for you guys to discuss um, this great novel, The Man Who Lived Underground. So I'm just going to get to the to the bio so we can get to the discussion. Our first panelist, uh, Ms. Julia Wright, the elder daughter of Richard Wright and the executor of his state. She is a journalist, essayist, and poet. She lives in Southern Europe, where she is completing a memoir on her father, please make some happy hands and put up some things in the chat room for Ms. Wright. Next is gonna be a good brother, Kevin Powell. He lives in Brooklyn, New York, and he is a poet, journalist, civil and human rights activist, and the author of 14 books. Woo wee, that brother doesn't sleep at all, 14, including his newest title, When We Free the World, a collection of essays, plus one poem about the present and future of America. Kevin is also currently writing his first play, and directing, writing, and producing his first documentary film. So please give up some hands and some shouts and put some things in the chat for Brother Powell. Next coming up, oh man, the teacher. He, he doesn't like it when we all do this, but I, we don't care. The teacher, the blueprint, the man who has laid it down so we can continue following, doing it in the right way. Dr. Jerry W. Ward Jr. He currently lives and writes in New Orleans, Louisiana. He is the author of the Katrina Papers, the China Lectures, African-American Literary and Critical Issues, Fractual Songs, Poems, and Blogs, and Other Writings. He is currently writing Richard Wright, An Unending Quest for Life. Again, give it up, put up some hands and some shouts uh, for Dr. Ward. Next, come on, Jackson's native son. This brother, Kiese Lehman, is a black Southern writer from Jackson, Mississippi. He's also a great hoop star. In fact, he used to be the brother that would be on the court. I was the dude who sat on the bench and gave you the high five when he came off the court. Brother Lehman's best-selling memoir, Heavy, an American memoir, won the 2019 Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Nonfiction. It won the 2018 Christopher Isenwood Prize for Autobiographical Prose and the Austin Riggs Erickson, Erickson Prize for Excellence in Mental Health Media. You know these are some important prizes because they got three names. They don't give you three names to a prize unless it's that important. And, it's, and, and Heavy was also named one of the 50 best memoirs of the past 50 years by the New York Times. And then finally, bringing in the blues, bringing in the funk, bringing in the hip hop, Charlie Braxton. Now there's some things that I should say formally about Charlie Braxton, but what I'm gonna say is Charlie Braxton is a graduate of Jackson State University. When I was at Jackson State, it made me so great, made me feel so great to see Charlie Braxton out there. When I was a student, Charlie was in every magazine I wanted to be in. He was in every anthology that I wanted to be in. He was interviewing every person I wanted to interview. A native of Macomb, Mississippi, as I said, a graduate of Jackson State University, an internationally noted poet, playwright, music and cultural critic. He has written the plays Blues Man and Artists That Live Here Anymore and the critically acclaimed collections of poetry, Assistance from the Ashes, Ashes, Cinders Rekindled, and his latest collection of poetry, Embers Among the Ashes, Poems in Haiku Manor. Now that we know each other, we can follow the Declaration of Parliament Funkadelic, and let's take it to the stage, y'all. So without further ado, what I want to do is I want to get right into it. I want to do a, a 1A, 1B question. And so I'm going to give a specific question for Ms. Wright to begin, and then I'm going to broaden it out just a bit for you guys. And so the question is specifically for Ms. Wright, why publish this book now and what transpired, what's transpired to make it happen? And then for everyone else, I just want you after Ms. Wright finished this, to explain to us why is it important that this book is published now. So Ms. Wright, start us off and then we'll get moving with, around the home. But you know, just as my father writes very nuanced books, 
That's a very many layered question you're asking. <laughs> uh, where do I start? I'll have to start back in my childhood. I'm sorry, because he gave me free range of his library. And my favorite poem was Oscar Wilde's uh, ballad uh, of a reading uh, to a reading or in a reading goal. And that was the epigraph to Savage Holiday, I found out later. Uh, another clue to the puzzle was that I loved Savage Holiday, which very few people know about. Another clue to the puzzle is Savage Holiday was dedicated to somebody I consider as my unofficial godfather. <laughs> a prisoner, my father, uh, freed from a New Jersey prison by interceding with the governor of New Jersey. Mm. And my father brought him home, and I lay newborn in my cot. Uh, all this adds up to what I call my unquiet legacy. So when fast forward, I became a journalist and my mother was executor of Richard's estate. Miss Wright, Miss Wright, I, I don't want to stop you. If you can, if you can, don't worry about it. But if you can, they want to know if you can move your camera down just a bit so we can see your entire face. If if you, yeah. if you, yeah. I, Let's see. There we go. Well, sorry. Okay. <laughs> it's worse. Okay. So, uh, where was I? Um, we received a letter, my mother and I, from a prisoner on death row called Mumia Abu Jamal asking us to intercede in his favor, ring a bell. It rang a bell for me. Uh, and my mother said, well, you take care of it, Julia. So I did. And I'm still doing it 40 years later. Mm -hmm. That's not so familiar. Um, now, here comes the crunch of the story. Because there's method to my madness here. When I used to go to visit Mumia on death row in the United States at the end of the 90s and the early 2000s, I would encounter two types of death sentences in the United States, the official one on death row and the wild one in the cities the urban shootings. So I remember James Bird. I remember Dante Donson. I remember Tiesha Miller, all death row bound. And so when it came to choosing the next book to publish, and I went to this air-conditioned calm at the Beinecke Papers. Okay. What a contrast. And I plunged into all these unpublished manuscripts. The man who lived underground, especially the cut-out pages, leapt up out as a forbidden narrative, the same narrative that I had encountered on my way to death row every time I went to visit. And it was imperative to me that this narrative should be restored just as the narrative of every unarmed black person in the United States should be restored, the same thing. And that would be my mission until it happens on April 20th of this month. 
Amen. Thank you so much for sharing that. So let me open it up. Uh, I know we're all different on everybody's boxes, so I'm just going to kind of go around the horn. So what I do is I go Brother Layman, Brother Powell, Doc Ward, and then Brother Braxton. So we're going that way, Brother Layman and then Brother Powell. Uh, can y'all hear me? Yes, sir. All right. Yeah, I just want to first of all thank you, C. Lee, for um, bro, just being being the brilliance, you know what I mean? Like the brilliance. And you don't really ever get to be on a panel where you are uh, – next to people who made you possible. But you know, Richard Wright for a lot of us in this world, but definitely from Jackson, gave us the fire. But even when you get that fire, you, you still need models. And mm -hmm. when I looked around for models, I found them in Charlie Braxton, I found them in Dr. Jerry Ward, and I found them in Kevin Powell. And awesome. for different for different reasons, but I also found Wright in those brothers without ever talking about Wright with those brothers. So I just want to say thank you for allowing me to share this space with people who have influenced me tremendously. Um, and I just feel like I don't actually believe in royalty, but if I did believe in royalty, I would call Julia Wright royalty. So thank Amen. you for, for making space. Um, and I, I'll be brief to just say one of the things that I was just fascinated with um, in the new book was the structure, but much more than the structure, um, I just don't think critics have been fair to Richard Wright. And this is not going to be a uh, KSA against critics um, conversation, but it's going to be a KSA against critics like minute right now. And I just think, you know, as much as I go across this country and folks who think they know Richard Wright talk about Richard Wright, the reduction of Richard Wright to some didactic scribbler right. uh, who tried hard and had right. a, it fought the good fight is just ridiculous, fam. And, and if we ever had reason to question its ridiculousness. The man who lived underground is proof positive of all these things we're gonna be talking about today in terms of politics. Mm -hmm. But let us not forget what this brother was doing with craft and what this man like refused to, to, to see. He refused to cede experimentation to mm -hmm. white folk. Like he was like, I am going to create experimental fiction for myself. And I think it's okay if we see right as an experimentalist. Mm -hmm. um, especially because he gets written as like this didactic, this, this like didactic writer so often. So I have so much more to say about the book, but I also just want to start by saying I was amazed with the experimentation, not just in the framing of the, of the narrative with like the drama and then like all of the existential stuff, but also I was just really, really enamored with the way Wright to some degree was just very, very um, um, obsessed with like layers and layers of blackness in this book, not just in the man who lived underground, that 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 narrative, but in the second portion where he talks about his grandmother. And he he does something I think we don't allow Richard Wright to do, which is to see play in black women, right? He talks about the way, you know, his grandmother in some way created a blues and a jazzy kind of like uh, model for him too. And we hadn't seen Wright talk or write like that. But I think the important thing I was talking about this yesterday is Wright wrote this long before a lot of the critics came out talking about what he doesn't do well. So I'm not going to try to like um, raise Richard Wright from some ashes from some critics who don't even deserve to be uh, named. But I will just say this book to me shows why Richard Wright is one of, if not the best American writer in history. I say, Brother Powell. Wow. Wow. Well, thank you all so much. I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be here as well. Um, we are all, um, Definitely touched, uh, Brother Lame, as you said, by Richard Wright. Uh, Miss Wright is an honor as always. Um, I, I love your father. I'm in love with your father. I've been in love with your father since I was 18 years old. As I said in our last discussion back in the fall when I first read Black Boy and then Native Son and then everything else I could get my hands on uh, by Richard Wright. And he's one of my literary guys. He's one of my her literary heroes. And I think it's important uh, for this book to be out for a few reasons. It corrects, number one, the historical wrong that's been done to Richard Wright you know, by this, this, this literary canon, as they call it, um, this erasing that happened to his work and large parts of his work. It hurts my heart when I think about it and I was spending time today. And thank you, Dr. Ward, for the, you know, your thoughts that you emailed us earlier, just thinking about how the editors played and they jacked his work up so badly. You know, when you think about how Black Boy was cut in half, how things were, he was forced to remove things from Native Son and how this book, you know, literally, this book is like it didn't even exist. I'm, I've been posting about this discussion today and so many people have been saying to me, I didn't even know this book existed, which is gonna come out on April 20th, The Man Who Lived Underground coming out on April 20th. And it, it speaks to, you know, not only just his work 
talk about the racism that he had to deal with in the 1940s, the same decade in which my mother was born in the South, in South Carolina. And as we know, South means South of the Canadian borders that Malcolm X said. So in America, you know, but also he foreshadowed uh, with this book what we're in the middle of literally right now, the George Floyd uh, murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor last year. And we know this Derek Chauvin trial is happening in Minnesota right now. It may actually we may actually get a verdict right around the time that this book comes out on April 20th. You know, the book is about, you know, uh, 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 police terrorism. And we are living in a state of daily police terrorism in this country nearly 80 years later. And so, you know, what does progress really mean? I, when I think about the man who lived underground, what does progress mean for black people, for African people in this country? You know, yep, we got a few of us who've made it in certain places. Yep, we got people here, myself included, have been published. But guess what, y'all? The same things that Richard Wright had to deal with with this book and his other works, who cares if I got 14 books published if I still have to deal with people not understanding why I write in the first place. I write because of people like Richard Wright. I write because of people like Gwendolyn Brooks, Margaret Walker. I write because I am trying to make a sense out of the chaos of this world, which is what a Mary Baraka taught us, who also was inspired by Richard Wright. And I feel that, you know, when we talk about why this book needs to be out there, it's because this country has never, ever, ever been honest about racism, this system of racism that has literally done everything it could to destroy us as a people. And I'm talking about all people of color, not just black folks, but African people specifically, because that's who Richard Wright wrote, wrote about the most. And, you know, it's a miracle. I feel that we still exist with our sanity. And I think it's a miracle that his work is there. You know, so why is it important? Because people need this, the racial reckoning that's happening in this country right now, where people have been literally apologizing to us as black folks so, so, for the last year. And it shouldn't take you know, uh, Richard Wright's work and George Floyd video being need to death is eight minutes and 46 seconds. But, you know, people need tools. And I think the man from underground who lived underground is an invaluable tool for a necessary and uncomfortable conversation about race and racism in America. Thank you so much, Brother Powell. Doc Ward. Yes, um, I, I want to turn us to uh, Malcolm Rice afterward where he suggests that his grandfather, he doesn't, he, he doesn't claim his grandfather actually used Plato's dialogues, but the allegory of the cave. And I think this is so important in 2021 for how we deal with life. We are all in a cave of one kind or another, and we have to extricate ourselves from that. But most importantly, with the publication of, of, of this uh, book, as I said in my notes, I, I'm congratulating uh, Julia Wright, and the estate, Malcolm, and Library of America for bringing it forth. Because once people engage the novel and the essay, Memories of My Grandmother, they are compelled to read differently. And this goes back to what you were saying, Casey, that people have not truly trained themselves to read Richard Wright so that you can give him the latitude of being didactic in a very positive sense, but also to attend to the words you use, craft. I mean, because if you, if you compare line by line, the novel with the short story that's included in Eight Men, you're in for some surprises about the use of language. Thank you so much, Doc Ward. Brother Braxton, bring us all home on this question. Okay. Uh, the most important thing about this book to me is, uh, as Kevin and Kiese uh, talk about the timing of the book. Um, when I first read the book, it grabbed me immediately because the, I know so many young men, young black men who are placed in the legal system, who are innocent, who ha don't have the money, who don't have the, the contacts and the resources or even a lawyer to fight a case that's stacked up against them by a system that is hell bent on destroying them. And that is the one thing that stuck to me when I first read the novel. But as I got deeper into the novel, 
I realized that this is also a critique of one religion, organized religion. It is a critique of white supremacy. And it is also an illustration of how both things act on our psyche, oppress people's psyche, black people's psyche, and literally destroys them, but does it so subtly in many ways that you don't see it. And that brought home to me why this book was so important. That really brought home to me why that book was important. This is a masterwork. I don't care what the critics say, KSA. This work will speak for itself. Anyone who knows literature will, will acknowledge that. And anyone who doesn't, to hell with them. Excellent, excellent. I want to come back to uh, something that Brother Layman has set up for me, and I will begin with Miss Wright and come around the horn again. Uh, I want you guys to talk, and you've done it from a social political standpoint. Now I want you to discuss it from a specifically literary standpoint, if you so desire. That how has the first reading of this book impacted each of you from a literary standpoint? And so I'll begin with Miss Wright, and then come around the horn. So Miss Wright, get us started, and then we'll go around the horn. Um maybe more a psychological impact than a literary one. Maybe that's because I'm more sensitive to psychology or to my father's um, attunement to psychology because he liked Franz Fanon. Uh, he liked other psychologists. He read Otto Rank. He read Freud, of course, and others. So what impacted me most, and I think I'll rejoin some of you here, is his... I, I can hear hear my voice. I'm sorry, I'm upset because I hear my echoed voice. Um, he was, uh, I was very receptive to his notion of manufactured guilt, black guilt. How pervasive black guilt runs through both the man who lived underground and the essay and how pervasive black guilt runs through the Derek Chauvin trial today, through Darnella Frazier, through Christopher Martin, through all those, that testimony asking for forgiveness for acts that have not been committed. And that is what struck me even before I sat down and watched that trial. Um, manufactured guilt, I think, as I understand it, in my father's mind, was the mainstay of white supremacy. In other words, white supremacy cannot exist without absolving itself through manufactured guilt. So that's the takeaway for me. Excellent, and right on point as usual, Ms. Wright. Brother Layman? Uh, yeah, that, that, that hit me, fam. I, I, I'll, I'll just speak about, um, I tried to talk about this a little, a little early, but the way that, the way Wright frames the, the narrative, just using the dramatic, I'm just gonna say like using dramatic scenes on both ends, I think can, we can get lost if we don't slow down what Wright actually does. Because I think most people who talk about this are going to talk about the middle. I'm not not on this, but I think when the, when the book comes out in the world, what what's happening in the middle. But what what's wondrous to me as a, as a writer is like most people who can write the middle, and the middle of this book is like existential psychological, not just trauma, but like existential psychological exhaling, existential psychological inhaling, and it's like that that middle is I think the beating heart of the book. 
but you can't even get to that middle fam if you don't pace the drama in the beginning and the end like so superbly because these cops don't necessarily get pov or or subjectivity but we understand so much about what is driving them and there's a mystery there that's going to keep us reading into the middle until we get to the end and so again I love to talk about the politics and I just don't think we can talk about the politics effectively without talking about the politics of the way this man writes prose. And just like the patience in delivering dramatic scenes, y'all, is something as a writer who's trying to write some dramatic scenes right now that involve carcerality, I was just blown away with. And and, and the fact that the dude, again, we can't forget y'all, the dude was born in 19, oh, was it eight or nine in Mississippi? And that is Mississippi. And, and the dude is doing techniques and shit that I can't do. And I'm like the most trained writer that I know in my family. So it's, I want to hoist right up for what he was able to do. But I also want to love right enough to get into the weeds of what he was attempting to do and talk about some of the things that I wish the book would have done better. Because I think Wright asked us to do this. And one of the things I, I would love to have seen that book do was I, I wanted some attention paid to, to Fred Daniels' wife. And because I only read the book twice, I can't make any like assertive uh, points and proclamations about her existence and her lack of existence. But I will say my first two reads, I wanted, I, I wondered why she sort of disappeared from the narrative. And I wondered if it benefited the narrative a lot. And again, I'm asking that question because I think that's a question Wright would want readers of him to ask. Very good point, brother Powell. Thank you, brother Langan. A lot of powerful things there. I mean, a few things I think about in terms of the literary part of it, and I, I, I keep getting drawn back to what Ms. Wright said about the psychology of it all. I mean, one, we're talking about first native son, then the man who lived on the ground and black boy, all being written in a five year period in the 1940s, between 1940 and 1945. And of course, the man who lived on the ground is just coming out now in 2021. I think that we need to be very clear, uh, as Brother Layman was saying, that, you know, Wright was a masterful writer. I just went back and reread the piece that um, uh, Dr. Ward, you suggested we read from 1992 in The New Yorker. And honestly, I wanted to throw, fling my laptop out the window after reading the piece. There's some good points in there, but the writer went out of his way, a white writer, to talk about how Wright, you know, uh, undermined his own literary greatness because he talked about race, which is absolutely absurd and something that we've heard about, heard about black writers forever. And so to me, actually, I, re I reject that. I think that many white American writers who are considered the great writers in, of the canon are actually inadequate because they didn't deal with the realities of what has been happening in America from the very beginning. You know, they act like it doesn't exist. They actually rendered us invisible for real. And so I think Wright's genius with this book, even with the criticism that I agree with that Brother Lehman just said, is that he had an incredible ability to, to weave in a narrative, tell a story while also uh, talking about the larger issue of race, white supremacy, as Charlie Braxton said a moment ago, and they need five, 10 writers in American history who can say they've done that effectively and had that kind of impact. You know, the reason why that book was was suppressed is because it was that powerful, you know, and they certainly weren't, weren't trying to deal with that. I mean, let's keep in mind, as that book was be, as that book was being done, you're in the middle of World War II, where, you know, the big lies that were fighting for democracy to free the world of, of, of fascism and Nazism. Meanwhile, you know, you're still suppressing people of color in America. And, 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 and Wright was telling the truth about it all in a really incredible way. I agree. Uh, Brother Layman, that um, you want more of Rachel, his wife's character, because you're like, well, where is she after a certain point in time? And I don't know what that's about, particularly when you look at this this essay that's attached to the book where he has this, this great thing about his grandmother, which I actually think from a literary standpoint is kind of rebuffs people saying that Wright didn't know how to write about black women, which I think that proves that he did, you know what I'm saying? But I think that, you know, we also have to keep in mind, y'all, as uh, Brother Layman said, he was born in 1908. He was born in 1908 and he was one of the, you know, Wright came after the Harlem Renaissance where there was this flourishing of a whole a community of black writers. He really was kind of out there by himself, you know, as a literary figure and trying to navigate all this stuff while I believe trying to figure out like, how do I be a black man, a black writer in 1940 something America and tell the truth of what I experienced to the psychology point that Ms. Wright talked about? Because I believe that writing was a part of his healing and trying to figure all of this stuff out and, and, and make sense of the trauma that he had experienced from the very beginning of his life, you know, and, and still get published. And, and in the meantime, fighting these editors who are telling me that I can't say this, I can't say that. And so when I think about his, his, what it means literary, liter I think it's a miracle that the book even got done, to be honest with you. 
you know, and I think it's an, it's an incredible testimony of what was what was America like then, but it also is a credible testimony of what we still haven't gotten past because we're still doing the same things now. Uh, the last thing I'll say is that if you look at Native Son, man who lived underground and black boy, or me, Dr. Ward, Charlie, Celia, or Brother Layman, flight, 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 flight. This this pervasive theme of we I'm trying to flee this madness that I'm a part of, this oppression, you know. Uh, you know, him going into a sewer. You know, what a metaphor, because, you know, it could be argued from the black perspective that living in this society has been a sewer for black people, black men specifically. What was George Floyd feeling a year ago when he was his face was basically in the sewer as he's being kneed to death? And so I think that, you know, you know, that that metaphor of the sewer is quite powerful because it's saying a lot more than people thinking this black man is just going to go live in a hole somewhere. No, he's saying this is what it is that I've been living in all the time. Powerful, powerful, powerful. You made me think about uh, war, son, the world is a ghetto. Dr. Ward? I think we should uh, address this matter of uh, the literary the way Richard Wright himself addressed it. When we read uh, Memories of My Grandmother, one of his most persistent pursuits in terms of understanding his grandmother was understanding her idiolect, which is, you know, the difference between how one personally uses language and how one uses language among other people, which we call dialect. That suggests to us and helps us to understand why Wright got so excited about uh, Gertrude Stein's Three Lives. Uh, and, and he said, I wanted to hear English. Well, that's a challenge. Did Richard Wright hear English? I would suggest he did. And the English that he heard was the language that is at once uh, communal and very political. And as Wright puts it, because we got to deal with this in terms of the literary, it's surreal. He stresses surreality. He stresses how surreality is related to jazz and blues. So what you have to do is to, to get to the listening. It, it is very important that we, we listen. And as I suggested uh, halfway in my notes that I shared with you, what we have to deal with is how Wright uses this, the insights that he sweated to gain about language in order to suggest to us, you cannot talk about this country we call the USA without understanding that it's beautiful on the page, rule of law is severely stained by color coding, by racial inequities. You have to get the language. So you don't get all out of shape by, oh, the founding documents are so beautiful and they're about freedom. Oh, hell no. The founding, one of the founding documents, the constitution, is the constitution of slavery. And right, do that. That, 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 I don't care what the, the, the forces of evil will say and who attacks me. Our Constitution supports slavery, even with that little uh, proviso about you can't enslave people unless they have committed crimes, so you have to create more criminals so you can enslave people. What Wright was doing in his pursuit of language for me, and we get this in this novel. He was penetrating time future by writing a very strong message to us from time past. And that is, that prevails, that prevails. So as we become very sensitive as writers to write language, we should give him the done of having explained the literary. I mean, he really explains the literary in ways that we don't have to guess about it. I say that 
Brother Braxton. Okay, I'm going to come from um, left field in a sense, so y'all bear with me for a second. Uh, as, as Sister Wright said, that Richard Wright is that this novel is nuanced. One of the things from a literary point of view I find interesting is that the book also reminds me of crime novels, you know, Mickey Spillane, things of that nature. And he uses that genre to illustrate, again, the damage that white supremacy does. Um, Ms. Wright talked about how white supremacists need to have black guilt, but I submit that the black guilt that they put on us is a projection of their own guilt. The two policemen are criminals. Let's just be honest. They're criminals. They're rogue cops who are not looking to find the truth, who are not looking to find the real culprits, they are looking for any black man that they can put in a cell. You know, and so from 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 a literary standpoint, I read it as a, a, a psychological uh, crime novel. You know, and I, I in reading the thing, I found out Richard Wright read a lot of crime magazines, and I thought it was just brilliant for him to take that genre and use it to illustrate psychological damage that racism has done. Charlie, I think that's an excellent point and it actually puts a great book in on what everybody's saying about the whole notion that just writes nuancing of technique and structure has never really been adequately uh, studied and analyzed. So I thank you for bringing that final point. So let's go to another uh, question here. I'm, I want to skip around just a bit because you guys have got me to this point. So the question I want to ask, it may be an unfair question, but does reading rights work, especially The Man Who Lived Underground, as an existential novel, does reading it that way marginalize or minimize the text commentary on systematic racism? And so the, I guess I'm asking is, if a scholar or a critic or just an average reader says that, okay, I'm reading this as an existential book, can it also be read as a denouncing of systematic racism simultaneously? So I'll start again with, with Ms. Wright, give you a chance, and then we'll go around the horn to let you guys give me any, any comments y'all want to have. So Ms. Wright, take it away. I, I admit I'm stumped by that question. So I'll let the others take my slack up. And I'll answer Charlie uh, with the time I have. Um, I loved what you said, Charlie. It, um, it, I think it goes in my father's direction very far, very deeply, because my father also liked Jung and Jung's shadow theory and the question of projecting shadows, the projection of shadows. So yes, absolutely. Projecting, and all the, you call it the chiaroscuro of the man who lived underground, those whites and grays and blacks, that, that almost newsreel, those rainy, grainy blacks and whites, um, that's the projection of the, the darkness of the policemen on the innocence of the black people. But a flawed innocence, it's a flawed humanity. So I, I love what you said, Charlie, because it does go exactly in Richard's direction. Uh, I also loved what you said about crime. Uh, at the end of his life, one of his last ideas before he died was to create a crime magazine. And in this crime magazine, the focus would not be on the victims. He wasn't that interested in the victims. 
<laughs> strangely enough, he was interested in the profiles of the perpetrators and in profiling their shadows. So he would have been fascinated by Derek Chauvin. He would have gone into the background of Derek Chauvin like a, a retriever. So that, that's what I have to contribute. Thank, thank you so much, Ms. Wright. That was perfect. So, uh, Brother Lamb, if you want to pick up there and take the existential question or either Delta yeah. or Wright, the floor is yours. Oh, oh, Ms. Wright, thank you so much for, for giving us more language to understand Wright's approach to existentialism and what I'll just call big ideas. But, you know, I could just be brief with this question. Like, I, I think most writers, but definitely Wright needed the existential, what we call existentialism to not be bowled over by the big ideas. Like, you know, right could just, you know, racism could loom over here, empire could loom over here, anti-blackness could loom over here, could loom over here. But unless you existentially explore what all of these things do and are constantly doing in flux to the individual, to the body, to the body parts, I think that those things become, I mean, I'm not gonna say worthless, but sort of worthless. So and so so I I I don't think Wright's existentialism runs counter to what we see happening here with, with what Wright is critiquing. I think Wright's existentialism makes the critique much more active, um, much more dynamic because he you can't just say when you read a Richard Wright book, even though critics sometimes do, this is about racism. This is but yeah, it's about racism. But Wright is too good of a of a of a of a listener, seer, and writer to just allow like the big idea to carry the day absent real human beings. And I think existentialism is the connection between the body to body parts and these huge ideas that Wright actually named um, for us. Excellent insight. Brother Powell? I'm, am I on? Okay. I mean, Lame, Brother Lane, you said it all. I just, you know, I'm trying not to give away this this book because I know a lot of folks are excited to read it, but it's just like, you know, when you look at this, 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 this character, you know, Fred, this character, um, you know, the, reading it, and I was, I was excited to get the advanced copy as well because I mean, it's Richard Wright. You know, it, it's like it took me back to when I first encountered Richard Wright and his other works. You know, the short stories, the novels, even you know, the essays that he wrote, his haikus, everything. You can't help but read him and feel everything that he's talking about. You know, and that's that's it, it sends chills through me because he had an incredible ability to capture, as, as Brother Lehman just said so eloquently all these different big ideas that are happening you know you know this is what the police are doing to me this is what racism is doing to me this is what i'm doing as dealing with you know as i'm fleeing this situation and it, it's it's like you have to be a really gifted writer i don't know you know existentialism i mean they like to attribute it to to the to, to writers after right or some of his contemporaries but they never want to give the term to him but i just i think he's very much in that tradition um i you know in hip-hop we would just say he's real you know he's real just like DMX, who just died today, one of our great rappers, was real. You know, Richard Wright, if he were in this era of hip hop, he's someone we would actually call one of what is he called reality rap because that's what it was. You know, you actually felt the experiences of what it was to be a black person, a black man in America through his literature. And it's a very incredible gift that he had. And so, if that's existentialism, then so be it. Thank you so much, Brother Powell. Doc Ward. Before the program began, I shared a, a, a thought I had about existentialism and Richard Wright. And I have long contended that Richard Wright was a native of vernacular existentialist long before he heard of anybody from France. He had a Mississippi existentialism that those of us from this state share. Of course, Kevin, you have a New York, uh, New Jersey, um, South Carolina existentialism in you. Uh, but those of us from Mississippi seem to never say what we think is obvious. And that is that we have been dealing with our lives and the lives of other people, particularly through music, existentially. That we have done it through language, uh, all of the uh, language gestures, the signifying uh, is a way of trying to deal with the, the, the fundamental questions that 
theoretically existentialism as a kind of philosophy wants to raise. We don't have time to theorize, we live. We live. And it doesn't mean I'm throwing theory out of, of, of the uh, out, of, out with the baby at the bathwater because uh, I had some training as a theorist, but I I, I choose not to uh, genuflect the theory. Or as Wright told uh, Kwame Nkrumah, you have to be on top of theory. Don't let theory be on top of you. And I believe that is exactly what we have to deal with in 2021. We don't throw theory away, but when we talk about existentialism, PhD, I'm with you. I'm going to say Richard Wright has some things that he could have taught to some European existentialists. I say, Brother Braxton. Okay. Um, I want to carry on what Dr. Ward said about um, Mississippi existentialism, uh, a term I will be stealing from you, Dr. Ward. Um, I think when you live the blues life, the blues in and of itself is existentialism. You know, uh, I mean, seriously, you have to think about dealing with hard times and then having to smile in front of people who hold your life in their hands when you really want to choke their asses. You know, that's existentialism in and of itself. So Richard Wright, like Dr. Ward and Kiese, he knew existentialism before they gave it a name. He lived it. So you ask the question, does this diminish the novel? In no way. No way, shape, form, or fashion. I'm not a theorist. I didn't. I didn't get trained in the academy like that. <laughs> so <laughs> I dropped out of that. Look, here, but you are. But you. You just proved that blue sensibility is the best theory we can have. So I want. I want to move us around. And then. So what I'll do is I've, I've been starting. I've been. I've been starting with with uh with Miss Wright. So I'm. I'm gonna move it around, and I'm gonna let her. Uh, bring us home on this next question. So I'm gonna start and go in the opposite direction. So I'm gonna start, Charlie, with you, Doc Ward, Brother Powell, Brother Langham, and then let Miss Wright uh, end, end it with this on this question. So here's my question: How will this novel and the essay "Memories of My Grandmother" impact the manner in which many critics have been unable to address the complex and nuanced writing and ideology of Richard Wright? And so. Charlie, I'll let you start that way, and then Doc Ward, and then Brother Powell, Brother Layman, and then we'll let Ms. Wright bring us home on that one. You know, I'm going to lean on my hip hop. This, this novel is the ultimate mic drop. This novel is so good. It is so great. It is so powerful. It is so nuanced that any critic worth their weight and salt cannot see the brilliance of it they need to retire from literary criticism and go home. End the discussion. Thank you so much, Brother Braxton. Uh, Doc Ward. Well, at the risk of uh, acquiring some new enemies, which I seem to have a great collection of them, um, I would suggest that Critics who are truly critics and not pseudo critics will indeed engage what you call the complex and nuanced writing and ideology of Richard Wright. Now, they don't have to agree with the ideology. That's okay. They will push back against some of it. But they will have to admit, if they are indeed honest, that he is, and I, and I, I make a hyperbole, he is, for the 20th century, 
the single American male writer who began, had humble beginnings in Mississippi, but kept creating these concentric circles of interest so that there is no other writer from Mississippi who speaks with the international authority of Richard Wright. Now, I'm gonna get into trouble later this summer when I say the same thing about Wright, Wealthy, and, 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 and Faulkner. I'm sorry, they just don't measure up to Richard Wright. And the point is, when you are really being a critic, when you're being a critic, you don't have to put down uh, where is the voice coming from by Eudora Walter. You don't have to put down Absalom, Absalom by, by Faulkner, but you certainly have to put up the man who lived underground and other works by Richard Wright, many of which he mentioned in Memories of My Grandmother. He goes through his uh, 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 previous works. You have, to, you have to understand, look, we are in a life and death struggle in the 21st century. We do not have time to play intellectual games. And if you have the time to do it, please don't play them at some privileged, segregated uh, 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 finishing school. But don't play it with me. I always call for Dr. Ward. Brother Pal. Dr. Ward, I mean, you know, and Dr. Ward knows what I'm talking about as a longtime educator. I'm sitting here thinking about all the writers that I was made to read in high school that I was told these are, this is the American tradition and none of them look like me, you know, not even remotely. And, you know, in this book, The Man Who Lived Underground and Richard Wright's total body, complete body of work, because we need to acknowledge his entire body of work as a canon by itself. You get the totality of what it was to be a, a, in America in the 20th century, you know, uh, from all different angles, as far as I'm concerned. And, you know, I'm thinking about what was said earlier about existentialism, about the blues. I mean, I feel the blues motif throughout his work. It is definitely existentialism, you know, based on what my colleagues just said and their definitions of it, which I loved. I also feel that with, with Richard Wright, he forced, there's no James Baldwin, there's no Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man without Richard Wright. You know, there's no black arts movement without Richard Wright. You know, in a lot of ways, there's no civil rights movement without the work of Richard Wright. You know, he foreshadowed, there's no hip hop without Richard Wright. You know, I'm, I spent part of the day, my day was been with DMX and Richard Wright. That's my day today. You know what I'm saying? Back and forth. And I'm listening to Slipping and other songs by, by DMX. And I'm saying, my gosh, this is Richard Wright trying to make sense out of all this madness. This is the trauma that I've gone through. I'm going to use my craft as a writer to tell these stories. I mean, Celia, you'll appreciate this, I feel, as well, as a lover of Prince. When I think about Prince, there's a direct line from Richard Wright to people like Prince because it's about self-empowerment. Richard Wright was a freedom writer. His work, his body of work is a freedom song. And I agree with Dr. Ward. You are not a good or great cultural critic if you are culturally illiterate and don't understand the world that produced a Richard Wright. Now, I'm not just talking about black people. I'm talking about Mississippi, the South, America, because the problem with a lot of these critics in America is they are culturally incompetent. All they know is the little bubble that they travel in. I mean, I can't imagine the way I was socialized coming up by people like Dr. Ward, you better know black literature, you may need to know this literature, you need to know everything. You gotta read everything, you gotta listen to everything. And then you have to be able to connect the dots. And to me, there's no way to approach a book like The Man Who Lived Underground, which I agree is one of his masterpieces, if you don't have all these different layers of experiences already, because otherwise you're not gonna understand what he's talking about. You're not gonna understand the work and you'll just reduce him to just this writer talking about racism in the 1940s and can't even see the connection to what's happening in Minnesota right now. Excellent, brother Pop. Come on, brother Layman, talk to us. Uh, absolutely. I mean, should I? I don't want to talk. I just want to <laughs> get a granny fan out right now. Um, let me let me just say one thing, fam. Um, Eudora Welty, outside of our region, is one of the most underrated writers ever created. William Faulkner, I think, is one of the most gifted, and I think misread writers in the history of the world. Those two Mississippi writers can do things 
that maybe five or 10 other people in the history of writing that I've seen can do. And write can do everything they can do times 30. And I just want to sit in that fam because he had to. You know what I'm saying? Like, we don't have to shit on Wealthy. We ain't got to shit on Faulkner. And this is what I, I just so appreciate and love what y'all are doing in this space, fam, because I'm all about the subtext. But sometimes we want to bring that subtext to the to the hypertext. And the hypertext is, it's all the shit we say about Mississippi and race and region and environment and education is true. It, it can't all be true and Richard Wright not be the or one of the greatest. It can't be true. Everything we, everything we Everything we say about this shit, can't, if, if, it, it's, if it's true, it's true. So if it's true, then we're going to have to talk about how this brother, 1908, not just made himself into a writer, made himself into a curiosity machine. Not just about Mississippi, but he knew there was some connection between Ghana and Mississippi. And not just Mississippi as a whole, but Jackson and Natchez. And so I am one of those people who believe in crit critiquing right to the nth degree. But what I also believe is sometimes we got to tell the whole truth. And the whole truth is there is no way in hell you can put many right. I think, you know, I think you got to talk about Morrison. I think we got to talk about Baldwin. I think we got to talk about a few other people. But what we don't have to ever do is diminish any writer to talk about how fucking like abundant and literally like, I mean, Kevin, you talk about what he did for DMX fam. The first time I heard Scarface, you could not tell me right did not influence that somehow, some way. When I hear Biggie, everybody talking about what Scarface and Pac did, but like, yo, we got to talk about, and I think it's misreadings of right to talk about just the fatalism and all that. I think Afro pessimism is confused a bit now, but I think Wright was writing through that shit fucking decades ago. So I'm critical of this brother, but I also just think, fam, there are not enough words or superlatives in the world to talk about what this motherfucker did with the word. And I don't need to down no white people to talk about how great he is because he just there by himself. I, to me, to me. Excellent. Powerful. Miss Wright, talk to us. Uh. I took some notes while you were all talking because <sighs> this is marvelous. Okay, first, uh, yes, you spoke about hunger. That's the key to it, according to me. He was hungry for everything. Everything was an extra layer for him. Um, his curiosity was a form of eating. And he was layering food upon food upon food. Mm -hmm. um, also, his curiosity about film. Uh, film as narrative. His lifelong... Uh, um, uh, interest in film, the uh, use of film as narrative, and the use of narrative as film, introducing techniques of film into narrative, um, which also you can take to what's happening today in the United States with cell phone narrative and how we are taking back control of our own lives and our own deaths through cell phoning our deaths in the streets. Um, and then that way my father had of thinking outside of the box all the time that just got people so embarrassed he was an embarrassment to a lot of people uh remember dr parks saying to my father how the hell did you happen dick i mean it was a joke but he was uncomfortable uh, there are layers that get to be uncomfortable. 
There are layers that are comfortable. There are layers that verge on the very uncomfortable. And I get to the underground layer. Now, what could the underground layer represent? And that's where I'm going to go back to what happened to my father after he wrote Native Son. He was approached by a friend of his called Dr. Wortham, a psychiatrist, who said, Dick, would you be willing to submit to a couple of sessions? And Dick said, oh, no, I don't believe in that stuff. <laughs> and uh, Wortham said, uh, well, you don't have to believe in it, but I can tell you something creative will come out of it. So he finally convinced my father to do it. My father submitted to a couple or two or three sessions. And Wortham later wrote something called The Unconscious Determinants of Native Son, in which my father recalled on Wortham's couch that he had, as a young boy, walked in a park with his mother and had been caught by his mother staring at a little Mexican girl who was naked. And his mother had severely scolded him. And this is how my father encountered what he later explored right afterwards through Freud, and that is the unconscious, which is the underground of the mind. So that is the sewer. And my father makes no bones about it in the essay. He talks about the unconscious. Thank you so much, Ms. Wright. Uh, just want to just a programming note because this is this is wonderful, and, I, and so as the moderator, I didn't become a fan, so I got to do one quick programming note for all you guys just watching us. Don't leave, don't leave, because after this brilliant panel is over, there's going to be a wonderful spoken word uh, uh, presentation. So uh, this is what we do at the Case Festival. We hit you on all sides, upside the head, down the back. You know, this 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 is that blues funk that we bringing you from the Margaret Walk Alexander Center. So don't leave us. I uh, want to give a shout out to Dr. Helen Crump, my cohort in the Department of English uh, as the Case uh, uh, Festival Coordinator. Uh, it, it, look, this sister isn't just a brilliant scholar. She's a brilliant organizer of folks who don't want to be organized. And and and, and, we, and so you have to understand who Dr. Helen Crump is. So I have to always give her that shout out. Now, Couple of time for a couple more questions because I want to make sure that we end right at 3.40. So the next question I want to ask is, and, and I'll do it the same way. We'll start with Charlie and go around the horn. Uh, are there any parallels or thematic connections that can be made between Wright's Fred Daniels circumstance of living underground in comparison to Ralph Ellison's unnamed protagonist circumstance a living underground. So what kind of parallels or thematic comparisons do we make to these two characters living underground? Brother Braxton, we'll begin with you, Doc Ward, Brother Powell, Brother Layman, and then end with Miss Wright. So go ahead, Brother, Powell, uh, Brother uh, uh, Braxton, get us started. C. Lee, you've asked me a question that I'm going to have to defer to the experts. I've, it's been a long time since I read Ellison's book. Um, so I'm not comfortable answering that particular question. Dr. Ward. Hello, can you hear me? Am I unmuted? Uh, I'm sorry, you good, Doc, go ahead, you good. Yeah, you're hearing me, okay. Yes, sir. I'm gonna have to uh, uh, apologize to everyone because I got to run off to Memphis virtually to be at CLA for a session that starts within 15 minutes. 
So um, I want to say thank you to all of, to, to UC Lee and to all of my fellow panelists for a very excellent discussion. And if people have some questions, you all know how to email me about anything that you want to know. I would say that, uh, again, I'm going to give credit to Malcolm for the cave. He makes us think about the nature of the cave. And uh, the unnamed protagonist in Ellison's story is uh, his choice of going into the cave of uh, it's kind of well thought out because we've got so much novel before he gets to the cave mm -hmm. right fred daniels has to leap into the cave to save his life yeah. now does that mean that uh one is better than the other no i'm going to say they're different there are different ways of, 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 of negotiating cave nests. Poor Fred Daniels is so traumatized by the brutality, the terrorism he has he said he has experienced that what he begins to do is of an interesting reversal of something that uh I attributed to Richard Wright in another uh, piece of writing where I said Richard Wright was dangerous because he was Prometheus. He grabbed the fire, the illicit knowledge, and that's why he was so disliked by certain people. Well, Fred Daniels does the Prometheus thing as far as I'm concerned, as he looks from the unconscious, as, as uh, Julia said, from the underground at the external world and what is and is not right there, and then wants to endow people, except that he tells the wrong people, the criminals, this is what's going on, and they don't believe him. In fact, they don't believe him to the extent of knowing if we let this man out saying all of this kind of stuff, he's dangerous. You have to kill his kind. And there's a very interesting uh, 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 connection here later. It's also in Eight Men. Man, God ain't like that, where the, 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 the fellow who kills his uh, employer, the French police do not believe him. He can't kill him. He, he, no, no, he, he couldn't kill him. So I think I see, uh, you know, uh, uh, people are going to be very much more comfortable with Ellison's cave than they are with Richard Wright's cave. And uh, if I if I have to have five more minutes, so I'll just stay and listen to everyone else, and then I'm going to have to go. And thank you also. Okay, I'm on. Go ahead, Kevin. Does anybody just want to address that? I mean, really quickly. I mean, I, Dr. Ward kind of said it all, and I agree with Charlie. I, I want to mostly defer to him as, as our elder and, and, you know, scholar here. Uh, um, but I couldn't help but think about what Toni Morrison said in her documentary about Invisible Man, which is a very important book to me, uh, Invisible to Who? You know, if you just look at the titles of the book, you know, the two books, The Man Who Lived Underground and Invisible Man, it is, you know, the, Dr. Ward is right. You know, Fred is literally struck, fight, fleeing for his life. And with Invisible Man, it was calculated. And I almost wonder, is, a, is this a conversation about here's nationalism trying to save my black, you know what, <laughs> the man who lived on the ground. And then here's, you know, this person whose whole life has been spent trying to get the approval of people. I'm just going to go on the ground for a little while and take this break and chill. A kind of a, a bourgeois aesthetic. And it is it, it, notice that the visible man, the visible man is not the book that was missing in action for the past 80 years. It's the man who lived on the ground. I think that says it all right there. And yeah. even as as important it is to me what Allison did. But I just I also think about, you know, not just the two characters, the unnamed character, Invisible Man and, and Fred and the man who lived on the ground, but also the kind of 
politics that Richard Wright had, which is my politics, which is a politics of liberation, and the politics that that Ralph Ellison was accused of having, which you know some people said, well, it really wasn't about black folks most of the time. I'm going to leave it there because I just think that you know at the end of the day, I'm encouraging everybody to please read the man who lived underground. And you know, it, 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 if anyone ever asks me which black male writer do I think black folks or black men should read first, it's always going to be Richard Wright first and foremost. Amen. I say. I have one more question, and we're gonna take one from the uh, uh, um, from the audience. Uh, but does anybody want to jump in on that before I move to my next question? Just want to make sure that everybody who wanted to answer that question about the connection between yeah. Fred and I, the other. Go ahead, brother. I'll be real for you, bro. You know, I, I just think <laughs> again, it's just so easy to, to to appear like you're dissing the, the literature that we're putting in context with with the man who lived underground. But again, I think it's important that the last lines in on a visible manner, you know. But who knows? But on lower frequency, who knows, but on what lower frequencies I speak for you. That says everything to me about who that writer and that book is sort of like written to or for or privileging on the first row of that audience. Do you see what I'm saying? So Fred Daniels cannot write, but if Fred Daniels could write from that hole in the ground, that is a sentence he would not write, right? Like this direct address to this you that I think Ellison wants us to see as universal slash white. Who knows? But on the lower frequencies, I speak for you. Well, you know, the un, like Fred Daniels and Wright live in them lower frequencies, and so that's not a diss. That's not a diss of what Ellison is doing at all. But it, but I think it is fundamentally different. I think I think their undergrounds are fundamentally different, and mm -hmm. and I would love to talk about that, like you know, a few a few a few weeks from now. But like I I I think I think the difference is, yeah, I I don't even know if one of them is underground, <laughs> and. And if you if you think about Visible Man the way it starts, it's all these lights under under underground. You know what I mean? Which right. is which is which which I think gives 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 like I love that, right? I think that is sort of surreal. But um, who knows when the lower frequencies I speak for you? That hit me when I was a young person. But I think when you follow the trajectory of what it says about the audience that he's privileging, um, as Morrison said, invisible to home. Right. And and I think that all three of you are really making the great point is that. Here you have two brilliant black minds using the same trope in completely different ways. Exactly. I think the problem, as you said so eloquently, Brother Layman, is we tend to want to play these brilliant brothers against right. each other rather than recognizing the genius of the complexity. But of course, we know they don't recognize the genius of the complexity because to do that, they'd have to recognize us as human. Right. In order for me to say Layman is genius in a different way that Powell is genius, in a different way that Ward is genius, in a different way that Braxton is genius, I would then have to accept you all as human beings. Yeah. And so that so I think that you guys really got us to the point I wanted us to say is that what the brilliance of it is they're using this trope in nuanced and different ways to really show you the humanity of what it means to be an African being. I, I, I mean, yes. yeah, Ms. Wright, yeah. did you want to jump in before we get to these last two questions? Um, I'm going to be like Charlie and I will defer about Ellison, but I'd like to get back to Rachel because Rachel's a woman, a black woman, and I'm a black woman, so I'd like to answer for her. Um, the only answer I can find is one that goes back to slavery, when black families were deliberately divided, uh, broken, brutally broken, uh, sometimes by torture, in order not to exist as families. And I believe that this has been handed down through our literature, uh, be it my father or Morrison or others, whether it's consciously or unconsciously, the difficulty of coexistence of the black man and the black woman. I, I say that fully aware that Rachel has given birth to a black child and that that black child is me. Because in real time, my mother gave birth to me in 1942. So that's my answer for Rachel. The other answer is for black boy. I believe, and this is totally belief. 
I can't give any proof for that yet, that the man who lived underground was a rehearsal for Black Boy. Mm. I, 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 I tell you what, it, it, it turned out to be a great rehearsal. Uh, gonna a uh, couple more questions. Gonna gonna get us out of here. I got we got to deal with this. So when the when the novel opens, Fred is the most devout Christian. He sings in the choir. You know he he he, he you know you know I mean he, everything you want the devout Christian to do. Fred is it. Oh, but by the time we get to the end of that underground, no. Fred is peeping and looking, and he's like, oh, you know now. Here's my question to you guys, right? Understanding that the vast majority of Africans in America are some form of a of, of religious devotee. The question I ask to you as the scholars of this text, right? And I'm calling all of you scholars of this text, right? How do we get that segment of the African-American community who are governed by whatever religious ideology that they have to be open to this text so that they don't see this text as a denouncing of who and what they are. And so I'll start around the horn again and I'll start with Charlie. We'll end with Ms. Rice. So Charlie and Dr. Ward, if you still have enough time, then Brother Pi, I see the head shaking and that's why I asked the question. Yeah. I, you know, I ain't got no problem with taking the pen off the grenade because Wright would have wanted us to take the pen off the grenade. So, Brother Braxton, and then around the horn. Well, I'm ready to throw a few grenades, brother. Uh, <laughs> listen, I think it's important that we understand that Wright questioning Christianity did not mean he questioned God. Okay did not mean that he was not a spiritual being. But I think Wright understood by watching how Christianity was functioning in the Black community mm -hmm. as a form of oppression, that it prevented his mother from thinking freely beyond the confines of the Christian doctrine that did not serve her well. One of my favorite quotes is by a African-American historian by the name of Yosef ben -Yakinen. And he said, no slave has ever freed him, his or herself while simultaneously worshiping the God of his or her master. So in many ways, Wright understood that before Yosef ben -Yakinen wrote it. And that's why he questions Christianity. Now, me, I personally have been questioning Christianity for a long time. My mother called me a heathen. <laughs> and I love my mother. But we have to ask ourselves, let's look at the black community. I've said this before uh, in another um, right session. We have churches on every corner in the black community. Look at the conditions of the black community. We have ministers who are preaching this prosperity gospel bullshit. And they act like they've never read the words of Jesus Christ. I say. You know, so for me, anyone who reads this book and sees it as an anti-God book is misreading it. Amen. But if they see it as a critique of Christianity, which Christianity, Af and I'm speaking of black Christianity, needs this critique mm -hmm. desperately. Mm -hmm. Richard Wright has done us a great favor by offering us this critique. Mm -hmm. And I have to take his my hat off to this brother for doing that. Mm -hmm. I said, you know how much courage it took for him to do that in in the forties. <laughs> There's some of us in the two in the twenties who barely can do it. I'm with you. You right on point, Doc okay. Ward. I know you got to go. Let me let Doc Ward jump in and then around. Yeah, oh, uh, yeah. Hello. 
Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Doc. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, very quickly, um, I'm just going to underscore what Charlie just said, and I'll put it this way. It is impossible for people, Christian, non-Christian, whatever, to read any book and not feel some degree of alienation from what it says. That's that's part of the course. But if these uh, so-called Christians are so uh, cowardly that they can't understand why religion, as opposed to spirituality, perhaps, should be criticized, that's tough. You know, that's really tough. I have some other choice words which I cannot use in public about that. But uh, it's, uh, I, I, I just think, Celie, that um, we, have to, we have to be brave. We have to present all of Richard Wright, uh, and, and particularly this, this particular novel, and just let the chips fall where they're going to fall. We cannot control how people read. We cannot control how they absorb things aesthetically, uh, 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 morally, or whatever. So we just have to uh, present the book, present our feelings about the book, and allow them to either agree or disagree with us. And so everyone, goodbye. A kiss for you, Julia. And uh, I'll see you again soon, I hope. Love you, Doc. Thank you so much. Okay. Brother Powell. Talk to us, Brother Powell. Yes, sir. I, I mean, <laughs> Dr. Ward and Charlie said it all. I mean, look, I, I I I love Richard Wright. When I first read, and I love what you said, Miss Wright, when you said that um uh my notes, the the man who lived on the ground was a dress rehearsal for Black Boy. My mind immediately went silly to your question because I keep thinking about that scene in Black Boy where Richard Wright is appalled that the preacher's eating all the fried chicken. You know what I'm saying? Even that was a critique of religion, organized religion to me. You know what I'm saying? Like how, to Charlie's point, this, this, these, these, these uh, uh, hustling preachers who take even the chicken from the people, the fried, I can't even have my own fried chicken. And so I just think that, you know, I agree with Dr. Ward. What is the point of art if art's not going to push the envelope? And, and Richard Wright was an incredible mic dropper with pretty much everything that he ever wrote. Even if we have criticism of things, as Brother Layman said, and I agree, we should never put anyone on the pedestal and not say, can we have a critical analysis of some of these things? But overall, in terms of his body of work, I mean, this is someone who was incredibly fearless and pushed and, and challenged a lot of things that I think need to be challenged then. And he foreshadowed, you know, Dr. King's conversation about having the church, you know, being, is it, is it a relevant ministry anymore? He foreshadowed Dr. King's critique of organized religion. I mean, Malcolm X's critique of organized religion. He foreshadowed pretty much every rapper that you can think of who's worth his or her work, weight and soul asking about God. He foreshadowed August Wilson. You know, you go look at some of the work there where, you know, the character, the main character, main, one of the characters, Mar Rainey's Black Bottom is actually cursing out God. You know, that's all from Richard Wright, you know, in the man who lived underground, you know, because he, He's on a journey. The thing that I think about Richard Wright's work, his novels, his fiction, is that the character, you're going on a journey. And how are you going to go on a journey if you're not going to look within? It's like, well, what is this that I've bought into? And Charlie's right. I mean, I live in Brooklyn. I've been to Jackson, Mississippi. I've been to all the major cities in this country. It's obscene that this black church is dominating all these communities, yet our people live in massive poverty. It's obscene that there's not after school programs that could easily be in those churches, in the fellowship halls for our young people. It's obscene the number of people who think that, you know, just because they're a preacher, they're automatically a leader in the community. They don't read, they don't study, they don't travel, they don't cross-reference anything, they don't think about anything other than Christianity, they don't think about Judaism, Islam, you know, other forms of spiritual practices, of belief systems, yet here they are duping the people. And I think that the man that who lived underground, it, it's really saying I've been duped. That's what it's saying to me. I've been duped and I am now freeing myself of what I've been duped by. I agree with that. Well, y'all just taking a pin out that grenade. Go ahead, Brother Lehman. Brother Powell, bringing it, fam. Um, I, I guess I, I just someone just say, say something that's going to sound contradictory. You know, my grandmama was uh, born in Scott County, Mississippi, and she used her God, her God, and I think she created that God, and she would say that's not true, but I think she used her God and the insides of her church to free herself and to free her children. And because she did that work, that's one of the reasons I'm here with y'all. 
So when we start talking shit about Christianity, I also just want to say I got I got to give credit to my grandmama and and how she used some conception of her God to free me. And I would be much more free. And she would, too, if she ever asked herself out loud why the only white person who's ever stepped foot in our church is that stringy hair motherfucker behind the pulpit that they call Jesus. I think right could make us ask that question. And I think that my granny did a lot with what she was given, but I think she was too afraid to ask that question. And I know it was, because when I asked her that question, I got my ass beat, you know what I'm saying? So I just think some of our elders have done a lot with that Christianity. And, and some of our elders have given us wings with that Christianity. And <laughs> we know what that Christianity is all about at the root. And, and I, I just think those who used it to free could have been much more better, much better at freeing if they question the way Richard Wright did. I mean, I agree with you, brother. Like, I mean, look, my mother, single black woman, yeah. Pentecostal upbringing. I know faith saved my life. Yeah. Ways, but I also know like Richard Wright, I started questioning, well, what is all of this BS? You know what I'm and I need it right. I need it right to show me. I mean, this is what's so ill because a lot of the MCs I listened to were questioning it, but it's so fucked up that I needed to see the, I needed to see a black person on the page question it in this mm. fucked up way to, to, to feel that I could question it on the page. Do you know what I'm saying? Like we even talked about how like that white space literally feels like a white space even in 2021. You know what I mean? Mm. So I feel you. I feel you, brother Powell. I feel yeah. you. But but I would say, um, KSA and to Kevin, both your mothers and your grandmother, and even my mother and grandmother, reinvented yes. in that space. No doubt. Jesus for them. Yes. Okay. But my questioning of Christianity is not Christianity per se, but organized religion that uses Christianity or Islam or any other religion to perpetrate uh, frauds, yeah. to, to, to gain money Word. when people are suffering and Word. they're not ministering to that suffering. Word. A religion that teaches you to turn the other cheek, a religion that teaches you to be ashamed of your own natural desires. Right. Exactly. It's a, it's, it's a religion that is oppressive. No doubt. And if we, if we bring it back to the text of Richard Wright, be it this novel we're talking about or all of his work, I see Richard Wright's work as spiritual, which is different to Charlie's point than organized religion. No doubt. You know, yeah. and our, our responsibility as whatever kind of leaders we are, as activists, as literary folks, as artists, whatever, is to be that bridge to help get our people to understand as Richard Wright was trying to do for us, we got it. Now we have to translate and say, hey, we do need to question this, what's happening here. No doubt. Because why is it I'm going to a church and they're asking for donations five, six times in one setting? That's actually <laughs> insane. You know, and people ain't got why no is, money. And people why ain't got no money, fam. Exactly, why is yeah. the pastor eating my fried chicken? Like for real. And he's right. driving and, away in a Cadillac. And, and, and so we're gonna wind down. So I wanna get to Miss Wright and give her maybe the last word on this, but to kind of summarize everything you guys are saying about that misuse. And also, Charlie, not just to turn the other cheek, but the part that they don't teach is after you turn the other cheek, it's you know, Yeshua, the people think the name is Jesus, but really Yeshua says, you should also flee the oppressor like a tax collector. <laughs> so it, it's not turn the other cheek so you can get hit again. Right. Is turn the other cheek as you are fleeing the person who is misusing you, which, as we say, for revolutionary causes, doesn't ever get top. Miss Wright, please uh, take us home on this. We got about seven minutes left, and so I'm gonna let Miss Wright take us home. And then, if we have any more time, first of all, we well, just one before I give Miss Wright the floor. Thank you, everybody. We're gonna end at 3:40. You guys gonna get a 10 minute break to stretch, move your bodies. Put something in your bellies because that's what I'm going to do. And then come back at 4 o'clock because we're going to continue the blues and the funk throw down with some of the best spoken word artists in the city. So go ahead, Ms. Wright. Uh, uh, give us your take, please. Um, I, I think my father chose the names of his characters very carefully. Mm -hmm. uh, Bigger, the Daltons, because of their supposed colored blindness and Fred Daniels reminds me of the parable in the Bible 
going into the lion's cage. Mm -hmm. So there is a biblical reference here. And at the end of the book, um, Fred becomes a Christ-like figure. He has a message for the policeman. And my father, as an author, has a lot of respect for that message. It's uh, Fred is bringing the truth as he feels it, an existential truth. And he dies for it, like Christ does. So yes, there's a real belief that Christ, an existential Christ, can be a hero. Another thought is about Martin Luther King, number two. Not the number one pacifist, welcomed, sanitized, turned the other cheeky, etc., etc., but the one we like, the one who was killed for what he represented because he met with Malcolm X because he met with war resistors. So, yes, that's the other side of religion. That's the Cornell West side of religion. That's my father's side of religion. So, i just like to address one question in the chat here. What do you think we have misunderstood about Richard Wright? It comes from somebody. Okay. Hello. Um, what do you think we have misunderstood about Richard Wright? It depends who has misunderstood who. Hmm. Misunderstanding is in the eyes of the beholder. Um, one of the misunderstandings of my father that has most hurt my feelings, because I feel it's so unfair, is I've heard it said that he left the United States because he was seeking fame. He was seeking stardom. And I think that his whole work after he left the United States, everything he did, all the countries he went to, um, the writers he met, the Pan-Africans he engaged with, the Bandung Conference, uh, all the causes, the, the fact that he was um, an ambassador for the Scottsboro Boys, for Emmett Till in Paris, wrote articles about these cases, belies that so much that I can only think that these are myths and rumors spread by people who needed to sanitize him. That's a kind word. I won't use another one. But there are many ways of killing a man or skinning a cat. And so we, we got a hard out. Uh, Brother Paul, I saw you raise your hand. So if you can give us something in 30 seconds, I, I, I want you to go ahead and give us that, and then I'll close us out. Miss Wright, thank you. Um, 
we what you just said is what we all have to deal with as people who have been oppressed in this country and on this planet it is a constant effort to erase and kill us kill the wholeness of who we are which is why we write which is why we create which is why we do scholarship which is why we create art you know, people need to be clear about that. It's an effort, a concentrated effort around patriarchy, capitalism, white supremacy to erase, erase, or control. You know, and so that's what the fight is about. And I thank you for fighting to get your father's book back out there. Thank you so much. So I'm going to end by thank you. I'm going to end by thanking our panelists. Uh, I'm going to thank Miss Wright, Brother Layman, Brother Powell. Brother Braxton, and then of course, Dr. Jerry Ward, please give them a hand as they leave us. And I'll leave us on a question. And the question is this, is the greatest disservice done to not publish in this book, as Ms. Wright said, is that we didn't get the theoretical correct connection between the going underground of Fred Daniels and then the ascension of the protagonist in Black Boy, which is what Wright was trying to give us. My name is Silly McEnnis. Thank you for joining us at the Margaret Walker Alexander Center. In about nine minutes, return in nine minutes to join us for Write Out Loud, some of the most wonderful spoken word performances you will hear. Thank y'all for joining us. We'll see y'all in eight minutes.